This is Bishop John with a homily from Fire Dock for the 15th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The lessons today are uh, from the uh, book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. That's the Old Testament. Psalm 65, verses 10, 11, 12, and 13, and 14. The Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. And the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. I won't read them, but I will reference them all over the place, and you feel free to read all of them, too. The lessons this morning focus on how God moves in the world and how we respond, or, or how, how we ought to respond to His presence in our lives. In one way or another, they are all about how our Abba blesses God good soil with great abundance, as well as his faithful children with great joy, fulfillment, peace, and love. The, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, God speaks about the efficacy of his word, about how it always returns to him, having accomplished its mission. The rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it fertile, and fruitful, giving seed to the one who sows and bread to the one who eats, in verse 10. Just so, God's word goes forth from his mouth and doesn't return to him without achieving the end for which he sent it out. That's verse 11. Isaiah, second Isaiah, uh, Isaiah or whoever, is writing here at the time in the 6th century B.C., when there are rumors among the exiled Jews that the Babylonians who conquered them are quite likely to be overrun by the Persians. There will be a new sheriff in town, which has raised the possibility that their impossible return to the Holy Land and to Jerusalem might not be so impossible after all. What goes out from God also returns to him, but not before changing things in the world. Things don't change according to our plans, but rather according to His. We may not like this very much, but it's something we'd better take to the bank, don't you know? It's the way the world is. At the time here, the Jews are still morose and hopeless, still in captivity in Babylon. Cyrus II of Persia, Cyrus the Great, is on the march, however, with a large army and moving west out of Persia, adding to his kingdom as he goes. It seems to Isaiah that he is also intent on plucking Babylon, as it were. The prophet uses the occasion to encourage the Jews to get them out of their hopeless blue funk. Strange, incomprehensible events take place in the world, and then the world changes as our Abba intends. If we all claim we're on God's side and we're going to do whatever or go wherever that takes us, then we should be lifting our eyes and our hearts to Him in anticipation. We should see the present disagreeable circumstances for, for what they are. That is, as bumps in the road and not insurmountable cliffs. Like the ones listening to Isaiah here, we have reason to hope things will be turning out for the better. Smiles, everyone smiles. May, may I offer my apologies to Fantasy Island and Ricardo Montalban? King David's verses from Psalm 65 remind us that the seed has to fall on good ground or no fruitful harvest, quote-unquote, will occur. Given good soil, the five verses of the psalm paint a glorious picture of a land overflowing with fruitful harvests. The responsorial verses from the 8th chapter of Luke, uh, and the 8th verse, the seed that falls on good ground will yield a fruitful harvest. Yahweh visited the land and watered it, enriched it, prepared the grain, in verse 10. He prepared the land with his rains by uh, drenching its furrows, breaking up its clods, softening it with showers, blessing its yield, in verse 11. He has crowned the year with bounty, and all its paths overflow with a rich harvest, in verse 12. 
Even the untilled meadows overflow with it, and rejoicing clothes the hills. Verse 13. The whole world sings. Finally, the fields are garmented with flocks, and the valleys blanketed with grain. They shout and sing for joy. In verse 14. The image here is of a fertile, fecund land. Responding to the caresses of the rain, rains Yahweh had sent. And so the responsorial verse tells us, the seed that falls on good ground will yield a fruitful harvest. Does it look like most of the Israelites were farmers, you think? The images presented in these verses would have been universally understood and appreciated in the Holy Land. When we talk about people close to the land, we generally think of good, decent, God-fearing folk who can be trusted to do the right thing, quote-unquote, who are simply trustworthy. There's good reason for this. Even with the most thorough preparations for planting, nurturing, harvesting, and selling their crops, they all know there's more to the dance than they can control, these farmers. It isn't an environment in which arrogant, calculating atheists abound, now is it? It isn't randomness and stochastic processes that are responsible for the order we see in the world around us. The seasons, the rains, the fertile soil, the crops, and the other blessings we receive so regularly we take them for granted. It isn't such processes. It is rather the hand of Almighty God. He has created the universe and everything in it, ordered it and harmonized it, and all is a blessing to those of us, both individuals and nations, who have eyes to see and ears to hear. It is all as a blessing to those of us whose hearts are open to him. Here is where we reflect on our own openness to God, on our willingness to be quiet and listen, on our willingness to accept what we hear, on our commitment to act as he urges us. How consistently have we been good ground so far? And how urgently do we pray to be such for the remainder of our lives? So that, from Luke chapter 8 again, the seed that falls on good ground will yield a fruitful harvest. Eh? Will we respond in our lives to the soft, cooling patterns of our Lord's grace in the same way the land described in these verses responds to the yearly nurturing rains Yahweh has sent? There's no rocky or unresponsive ground in the psalm today. The lush richness of the bounty is only for the good soil. Paul continues the theme in the six verses selected for today from his epistle to the Romans, chapter 8. He tells the Roman congregations he believes, quote, the sufferings of this present time are as nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us, end quote, verse 18. All of Creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God in verse 19 to break it free from the one who subjected it and made it subject to futility in verse 20. He notes that all of creation hopes to be set free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's verse 21. So, so that it may, the whole world may cease groaning in labor pains, in verse 22. He and the other followers of the way, who have the first fruits of the Spirit already, nevertheless also groan within as they wait for adoption, the redemption of their bodies, in verse 23. Echoes of eschatology reign, ring through Paul's statement in verse 23. But he is really speaking for us as well, almost two millennia later. No one knows when the Lord Jesus will return, as it says in Mark 13, 32. But God is faithful and our Master will return. It is given to us followers of the way to prepare for it, so that we do what Jesus said we must to inherit eternal life. 
as it says in Luke 10, 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. All of the universe waits for the fulfillment of the kingdom of heaven and the earth. That makes it a pretty big deal, doesn't it? How will it come about? I propose it will be through the efforts of the Plebe Sancta Dei. It starts with a simple but profound faith. It starts with a deep and abiding commitment to be the children of God, to struggle with him as the new Israel, certainly, but never to replace him with idols of any kind. It starts with acting like our Abba loves us, and therefore we act like we want to please him. <laughs> what a concept. And by the way, it starts now. For each one of us, this is urgent. We are the hands and feet, the eyes and ears, the voice of mercy, and the healing hands of the living God. He redeems the world, reclaims it piece by piece through the efforts of his children, and we, through our faith in Jesus Christ, are his children. If not we, then who will do it? If not now, then when? In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, the nine-verse alternate reading for today presents the well-known parable of the sower. Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea, in verse 1, where large clouds gathered, crowds gathered around him, and therefore he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood along the shore, in verse 2. Our Lord began the parable with a sower going out to sow, in verse 3. As he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and, the, and birds came and ate it up, in verse 4. And then some fell on rocky ground where the soil was not deep, in verse 5. It withered for lack of roots when the sun rose, and it was scorched, in verse 6. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, in verse 7. And finally, some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit, a hundred or sixty or thirty-fold, in verse 8. Jesus finished with a straightforward admonition. Whoever has ears ought to hear, verse 9. The crowd must have been shocked at first to hear a story about someone wasting so much valuable seed. But surely they responded to the way he taught as they put together for themselves the puzzles that he, puzzle he had laid out for them. Jesus knew the hearts of his hearers and captured the conditions and concerns in the lives of all of them in the parable. The man sowing the seed in verse 3 is like our Abba, sending his message through his son to bring us back to him. Just as the point of sowing the seed in good soil is to have it bear good fruit, so the word coming alive in our hearts should deepen, grow, and change the soil, as it were, of our lives. Like the seed sown on the path in verse 4, when our lives are focused on everything but our Abba and our Lord, there is nothing in us for the word to nourish, and it disappears quickly with no effect. Like the seed on rocky ground in verse 5, we could be enthusiastic when we first hear the gospel, but there won't be much happening if there's no depth to our faith. At the first sign of opposition or trouble will wither away, so to speak, just as verse 6 suggests. The seed falling among the thorn bushes in verse 7 represents us hearing the message of God, but choking it out by being too concerned with worldly issues of wealth and social acceptance. We have to be good stewards of the gifts he has given us, certainly, but not by taking over the places in our lives where our faith should reign. Admittedly, that, that's most places, I suppose, but, but there you go. Finally, those who hear the gospel and let its truth blossom in their lives are like the rich soil in verse 8. The seeds are sown to good effect, 
and the earth produce, and the fruit produce will be both rich and abundant. We've read today about the rich harvest from the fertile soil in Isaiah, the land responding to the rain Yahweh sends in Psalm 65, the admonition of Paul to the Romans to keep their faith through the hard times, and the words of our Lord in the Gospel of Matthew. The same message is there in all of the lessons. God sends out his word and it moves in the world to accomplish what he has intended before returning to him. It always goes out from him and goes around changing things before it comes around to him again. Our Abba's intention, by the way, is to bless all of us if we accept the message his son gives to us. If only we return to him in faith. Or just plain turn to him if we haven't already drifted away. This would be an advantage to all of us because if we're paying attention, the rewards and gifts in our lives would be tremendous. We're talking about peace and plenty and joy and fulfillment and all sorts of other things that would fill us so full of thanksgiving and love that it would fairly burst out of us and get all over everybody in the room. So we'd be fools not to jump in with both feet. What kind of ground, what kind of soil should we be? Will we depend on God every day to extend and deepen our faith when it encounters thorns or withers a bit, or when our understanding has been too shallow? The words of Jesus speak precisely to all of us about the kind of soil that was rich soil and produced good fruit a hundred or sixty or thirty fold. It is only the children of God who work to send his word back to him with his mission accomplished. What goes around in our lives comes around through us and back to our Abba and our Lord. With every step we take we ought to remember this. This is about focus as one might imagine. As we move along our journey, along the way, we have no choice but to listen for the music of the spheres in the quiet times and to look for the flickering shadows in the places where we encounter thin space. There is so much magic and miracle in the grace of God and the comforter our Abba and our Messiah have loosed in the world. The miracle comes from God. And, can we, and we can wash our spirits in it if we keep our focus. The magic, however, takes place between us as we respond with overflowing hearts to the love our Abba has, has for us. If we focus on this, what else matters? The words of a song bubble up from my memories of more than a few Curcios Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. God bless you and yours, and keep you safe.